Um, so Megan's testimony uh, just left my heart tremendously. And she also said something that it's not even the first time I've heard that this week. And I, I have to remember every now and then to encourage everybody in this room that um, this Daystream Church experience is a little different than, than what you're used to. But a lot of people come in here and they get excited for the Lord and they and they um, get excited to pursue this relationship with Him that we talk about and hearing the Lord and whatnot. But um, the a lot of times people feel like they're the only one who's on this journey. And I want to encourage you that everyone in this room is on that journey. Um, a handful of us, and I mean literally a handful um, of us, have been on this journey a large portion of our life. Most of this room did not grow up this way. And is everybody's truly just finding their own path with the Lord. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And so don't feel like everyone's so far ahead and... Um, I'm catching up. Like, that's not an accurate assessment of this room at all. Amen? Amen. Yeah. However, everyone who's pressing in and <laughs> desiring the Lord, he's been faithful to me yeah. in a mighty way. Yeah. Um, and so today, as uh, I just felt strongly from the Lord yesterday when I was praying about what to do today, um, today is going to be, hopefully, for all of you, a day of experiencing the Lord. Today we're going to shift from... Um, you know, I always hope you experience the Lord. I always hope you, uh, the Holy Spirit touches you, blesses you. Um, but today we're going to read some scriptures, and I mean, we're going to slow down, and we're going to ask the Lord to show himself to us in that. Amen? Amen. I'm also going to read some lines where Jesus just throws in random amens while he's talking, so you won't think I'm weird for doing it too. Uh, <laughs> I throw jokes in to make myself less awkward. But, um, <laughs> all right. That being said, that today, if you are a visitor, God knew you were coming when he told me to do some uh, more abnormal stuff. And he wanted you to experience that. If, you're, if you've been here for a while and, and all of this feels new to you, some of what we do today is going to be new for everybody. Amen? Um, all right. I'm going to run through a quick recap of what we've been doing because we've been building on this idea for now uh, six weeks, maybe. Five, I don't know. I'm not good with time. It's been a long-running idea we've been building on that we as the believers in the new covenant are the temple of God and therefore the spirit of God would dwell in us. Now, <clears throat> this idea is colossal. It's, it just runs and runs and runs. It's probably one of the backbone ideas that runs from Genesis to Revelation, and it is it is tied to literally everything. Um, the idea that we've been working off of is in the book of Hebrews. It says that the instructions that they had in the former Mosaic Covenant, um, the divine instructions they got, as it says, to build the, the tabernacle meeting place and later the temple and the, and the things that would be in it and what they were supposed to do, that these things were simply types and shadows of the real thing that was coming. The idea is if that tabernacle, if the tent of meeting that Moses had and, and then later the Solomon's temple, if those things were just a shadow of what was to come and then um, Peter, Paul, and John to some degree clearly state time and time again that we are that temple, those things were just shadows of what we are supposed to be. Now, it says that they were inferior to what we are now. That doesn't mean they're worthless. It just means they're less than the superior version. The idea was that the details of the tent meeting place and the temple weren't irrelevant. It just wasn't God's perfect plan to dwell in the temple. His perfect plan was to make us temples and dwell in us. But the details and the order that things were built in the former temples would elude to the things of ourself and our heart. Yes? For those of you who have been here the last month or two, you should be nodding your head now. Yeah. That's what we've been doing. Yeah? I need affirmation sometimes. This is an important topic. Hebrews also says that this is a, he says that, um, you know, Jesus raising from the dead, repentance from sin, and praying for the sick and a handful of other things that is like all the Christianity talks about. He said these are elementary principles of Christ. These are just the elementary basic principles and that's 99% of what the world fights over and talks about. Um, 
And he says, but there are meaty topics. This is a meaty topic, meaning you're going to have to eat it for yourself. You're going to have to read and meditate and pray if you want to get all this. But if you don't want to do all that, just open your heart. Let the seed be planted in your spirit and we'll move on. Amen. So in a brief, brief recap of how we made the Old Testament, the tabernacle meeting place, um, likened them to our heart. We, we discussed so much stuff. I can't do it all. But the, the outer courtyard um, represents the part of us that's been purified. The walls is the part of us that's been purified from the Lord. White on the inside, colored on the out. World out there, purified in here. It does expand over time. There's a broad gate that's easy to get in and out of. The first thing they get to is an altar of atonement where sins are atoned for. Jesus uh, yeah, Jesus came to forgive us for our sins, right? The first thing you get to is an altar of atonement. The next thing you get to, everything's in order, right? Everything has to be gotten to in this order. The next thing you get to is the laver with uh, the, the, the holy water, the living water that would wash their hands and their feet, the, the walk of the life, the works of the life. And then they would enter into the actual tent or temple. And that tent or temple had two rooms, an, inner, an outer room and an inner room. The outer room was called a, a holy sanctuary. It was holy means it's set apart for things of the Lord. The inner room was called the holiest of holies or holy of holies. And in these two rooms, we started to look at that they have similar things. But in the holy of holies, it's things that God made and sustains. And in the, and in the first holy, it's things that we were told to make and sustain. Meaning there's a lampstand and a table of showbread out here. The lampstand, we were told to make it, and we were told to put oil in it and keep it going. We were told to make the bread and replace it week after week with a specific recipe, right? So we make and sustain one side, the first side. He has almost similar things, but are divine things on his side. He has an Ark of the Covenant that contains the testimony, the Ten Commandments, the testimonies of the Lord. Because of that, the presence of the Lord rested on that ark and in that room. And so they put, they had things that they put in there with it. And that presence of the Lord kept it going. In the ark of the testimony, there's a golden pot full of manna. Manna was the bread of life that fell from heaven, as Jesus said, in, when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Now this manna was the bread of life that God gave them to sustain them continually through their journey. Yeah? Every day manna would fall, and every day they could collect as much as they wanted and eat it, but they couldn't have extra because it would go bad. Except for on the sixth day, they could collect extra, and it would last for the next day. Um, and it was like a holy thing that God didn't want them collecting on the Sabbath, so he gave uh, like an increased shelf life, if you will, to the bread of life. And it became the holy Sabbath bread, the bread, of the, the bread that would sustain to the next day. That's over here on God's side, you see. So that's the bread that he's got on his side. We have the bread on our side. We have the lampstand. It's a golden lampstand with seven pipes. The seven pipes look like tree branches, kind of. And along those branches, there's almond blossoms that they forged into the pipe. In the ark, there's a, a rod or a staff that was Aaron's rod. So basically, a dead stick that they made a walking stick out of. A little more to it than that. But um, at some point in the journey, there was this test to see who God wanted to be the next guy in charge and they put the staffs in the presence of the Lord paraphrasing here believe me um, and one of them Aaron's rod came back to life and budded a branch that was a living branch came out of it and on it was almonds tree that came back to life with almonds lamp that has light with almond blossoms see his side our side I began to see that this uh, the two sides of the of the tabernacle or the um, temple were a picture of the covenant between God and man. His side of the covenant, our side of the covenant. All the covenants were, were basically built to say God said, I will be God if you do this. And all of the covenants failed until Jesus came and effectively fulfilled all of the failed partnerships, all of them, from Abraham to David to uh, Moses to, uh, to just all of them. The new covenant isn't an additional. It's a collective of all of them fulfilled in one perfect man, Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so this tabernacle, two parts, God and man's covenant. Now that's all supposed to be within your heart. What do we do with that? Well, we'll skip some of what that was about. But all of this was to say 
when we started on this, I said that I, you know, I've observed humans and collected data on, on how to know God and understand people and the relationship between them. And I've observed all these years that there are two very common heart cries or struggles within each and every human, typically, not, I guess not everybody, but one being people just want to know God, like know Him. They usually start off settling for knowing about him, hoping that leads to knowing him, but there's a hunger to truly know the living God. Um, <clears throat> and then the second common struggle was that there was a emptiness or a part of each, a lot of people that, although they don't come out and say it, when you ask the right questions, they will admit to it. There's a part of a lot of humans where they feel like they don't even know themselves. There's like sections of them that they don't feel connected to or, or fully understand or don't know what would, they would do and Yada yada, and I said that the conclusion I've come to all these years is that you don't have two struggles; that is actually one, and that and that there is a part of you that feels missing, and it's because that part of you that's missing is the God of the universe that is hidden within you and is protecting you from Himself. I believe, yeah, meaning He has all of this stuff in place, grace. Faith, all, hope, all this stuff, this journey, the commandments, all of it is to lead us to the innermost part of himself. Yeah, because everybody could come through that broad gate on the out court. Everybody could get through that one. Everybody could circle past the altar of atonement. But each step you go further, you have to get higher and higher in the order. Now, we don't longer have a high priest. Jesus is the high priest. We're all called to be priests. But there's this process in which we have to go through where he, where we can get that close to him. In this passage here where Paul said that we are the temple, earlier in this passage he says that Jesus Christ, the gospel they preached, was the foundation in their heart that he could lay. But every man would build their own house or temple on it. He says some of you are going to build a house of precious gold, silver, and stone. And some of you are going to build a house of wood, hay, and straw. And he said, and, and all of your works will be tested by fire. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about building one of those six houses, and at the end, it's a test of fire. I'm going with gold, silver, or stone. Yeah? The idea is, if you haven't started building with gold, silver, or stone yet, God is too good to simply disintegrate you with his fire before your time has come. Yeah. So that... That withdrawing from you, that keeping his fullness from you is an act of love and mercy where he leads us and guides us to himself. But make no mistake, any gospel that says that this life with the Lord is about, well, if they don't say it's about being transformed into his holiness, it's not the gospel of Jesus. It is not. That is a God. It is a false gospel, a false doctrine. This whole thing is about being transformed in every area of your life. Now, he's merciful and he's patient, so you don't have to get it right the first day. But if you're not every day hungering and desiring for one more thing to be dealt with so you can be closer to Jesus, then somebody has misled you about what this whole thing was about. Yeah. It says that if he foreknew you, this is Romans 8, getting all track here. If he foreknew you, which means if he, if he ever knew you at all, John says that he's the light of the world that's in every man, but not all take the right to become his children. Yeah? Ecclesiastes says that your spirit is a spirit in you that comes from heaven, and when you die, it goes back. He foreknew you whether you like it or not. Jeremiah, he says, I foreknew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. How many of you were formed in a mother's womb? <laughs> there we go. Thank everybody so far. He foreknew you before that. For all that he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into his image. Amen? Amen. This whole thing is about being conformed. This journey about understanding the temple language and what that might mean for us. It's all an attempt to be conformed into his image. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Yep. We said the showbread, lampstand side, that's our side, that's what we've been working on. We've been focusing on the showbread for the last two weeks. Showbread represents that God wants to be with his people. It's the bread of presence. <clears throat> it's what it became known as. It became symbolic of him wanting to dwell with his people. I can show you countless verses that I've found so far where there's just these random words that are used in our English translations 
that actually have something to do with the showbread, the presentation, the preparation, or whatever we've been covering the last couple of weeks. You got all that. But last week we also got into that this bread, this breaking of this bread, it was a part of their culture amongst each other where they would break bread with one another. It was like we're going to reconcile our differences. We're going we're gonna to come to terms and be at peace again. That last week's sermon, if you want more on that, go follow that. But that this showbread became the bread of reconciliation between us and God. Jesus became, became that bread. Jesus said, this is my body. Partake and eat. Right? Jesus became the bread of reconciliation for us in, that, in our covenant with him. But this idea that God wants to reconcile with his enemies. Yes, you are probably to some degree an enemy of God. Accept that. Deal with it. And march forward to the day you're not. It says in Romans 8 that if you have any carnal thoughts, worldly thoughts, any carnal walking or worldly desires, that you are at enmity with God. Deal with it. If you can't accept that fact, you can't get past it. Yes? Yeah. But just accept that there's parts of you that's at war with God, yeah. but God is so good. He's leading us to the part of you that's one with him. Amen? Yeah. Now, we said the lampstand represents the tree of life. The tree of life is the thing that gives life. We said it's of the utmost importance because it is the thing that in the garden that Adam got put out of, the garden for. We we think oftentimes that he got put out for eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God was not happy about that at all. But God actually said, well, put him out. Least he eat the tree of life and live forever. He didn't want him to be stuck in that state of now he's something that God didn't want him to be. He's like, whoop. I have to separate him from the thing that would keep him alive forever. Yeah. Because he's too good for that. He's too good of a God for that. Amen? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I had a fun point just popped in my head and I forgot it. It's quick as it came. <laughs> Look at that. It'll come back. Yeah. All right. That's what we've been covering recently. We're going to jump into some of the lampstand stuff today. But here's what I'm going to tell you. We're going to be in Revelations, uh, book of Revelation 1 and 2. 22. Today, I desire more than anything that you have an experience with the Lord. I experience with the Holy Spirit that's in this room. I have a desire above all things that you see the Lord in a fresh light today. Meaning, I have things to share, things to teach, but I will abandon them in a hot second if I think everybody's catching the wind and we're going somewhere. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, as we get into reading these words from Revelation 1, I will tell you this. This is a time to lose any distraction you have. If your phone ever distracts you, preemptively put it on put airplane mode. Yes. This is not the day for distraction. If your worries and cares, try to just cut them off. I promise you they'll be there in about two hours. Yeah. yeah. Take a break from all of it. We're going to open our hearts. We're going to open our minds. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit into our reading of these yes. divine words of Jesus. These, of all the words of Jesus, I, I, I treat them all with the most, the highest regard. The words of Jesus to me are the gold standard which I try to understand all of the scriptures through. But these words in, in Revelation are the highest of high. These are the holy of holies to me. These are post-resurrected, post-ascended, seated on the throne Jesus. This is the king of the most high talking. And I don't read them lightly. I don't repeat them lightly. In fact, if I'm in the woods alone, I can, I can quote these things in my head and just go to la-la land with Jesus. These are powerful words. Amen? So my prayer today is that as we read these words of Jesus in Revelation 1 and 2, that, and uh, maybe discuss the lampstands more, my prayer is that you begin to see who your king is. Now, for those of you who aren't used to uh, some of this language about seeing and hearing and all that, uh, what I'm asking you to do is just shut it all down, be at peace, relax, breathe. <clears throat> as we read, as we read his words, hopefully you begin to see the reality of these words in your mind. It, it's not going to come to life in the 3D image up here in the middle of all of us, most likely. Um, you're going to see it in your mind. And you're going to tell yourself, that's, uh, that's just my imagination, dreaming up those words. And I will tell you, maybe there's a reason Jesus said, if you can't become like one of these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There was a time and a day where God could use your imagination, but as we grow up, we shut that down. Like, God's going to get us in trouble. 
but it might be to take it back to him. Amen? Yeah. So we're going to read. We're going to ask the Lord to meet us. If you need to close your eyes, close your eyes. If you need to stand up, stand up. But just, I promise you, interacting with him today is more important than anything I'll say. So Jesus, right now, we just ask you, Lord, to just come into this room with your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord, to touch our hearts, soften our hearts. We open our hands right now. We let go of our ideas and our doctrines, and we just want to read your word right now, Jesus. We want to read your word, and we're asking you, Lord, to bring it to life in our hearts and our minds. We're asking you, Lord, to just make it live and interactive. I just speak against any um, anticipation or negative uh, negative anticipation of, of am I going to be able to do this? Just forget. I said forget everything. We're going to forget everything. I promise you. I've done this in way harder rooms than this before. It works. Just relax. Yeah. To some degree, you're going to feel him. You're going to hear him. You're going to see him. It's just something is going to happen if you can let go. As John was praying, he entered into a vision and he went to the heavenly realm. He heard a voice saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Then John turned to see the voice that spoke with him, and having turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, picture the lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, he girded about his chest a golden band. We thank you, Jesus. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to meet us in this place. Lord Jesus, let us humbly come before you in your... Let us humbly come before your throne right now, Jesus. We ask you, Lord, you gave us these divine words to not just to read history, but to find you. We ask you, Lord, give us the vision of you coming to see him standing in the midst of the lampstands, the midst of the trees of life. We thank you, Lord. One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Take us in a journey, Lord Jesus, just into your eyes. Let us not fear the flame of your eyes, Lord. Let us know that you're leading us to build a house of precious stone. You're leading us to build a house that survives those beautiful eyes of fire. As we approach those eyes of fire, Lord Jesus, let us, let us see that they're intimidating and awesome but eyes of compassion and mercy we thank you Lord we thank you Lord his feet were like fine brass and as he ref as if refined in a furnace his feet were like fine brass kneel before the Lord and see his feet just kneel before the Lord and see his feet like fine brass we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come close to you right now. We thank you, Lord, for come, allowing us to come close to you right now. We thank you, Jesus. His voice is the sound of many waters. As he spoke, he had a voice of the sound of many rushing waters. Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to let us hear your voice. Let us hear the voice of many waters. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of the mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. 
Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, so sharp that he could separate even the bone from the flesh, the spirit from the flesh. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that your, the righteousness of the word that proceeds out of your mouth, Lord, was to divide our spirit man from our flesh man. Let us walk towards you, Lord Jesus. Let us not fear the eyes of fire and the sword that comes from your mouth. But let us embrace the discomfort of knowing that you need to lead us and guide us into transformation to be with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The voice of many waters. He's referred to that several places, several times. All right, I don't know how this is going to go, but we're going to do it. I need full participation. If you uh, if you didn't grow up this way, I know it's uncomfortable. If you're a visitor, I know that's super uncomfortable. We need full participation. I need everyone right now, loudly, not me, loud. I need everyone to repeat after me multiple times, voice of many waters. Don't say it in unison. Say it how you want to say it. Say it loud. Say it quickly. Are you ready? Voice of many water. Everybody, come on. Voice of many water. Voice of many water. He's the voice of many waters. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Everybody, come on. Louder. He's the voice of many waters. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The voice of many waters. The voice of many waters. All right. Thank you, Lord. Now imagine what it sounds like when water's running over rocks. It took me years to come up with the voice of many waters. He's the river of life that flows out of this temple in your heart. He's the God who speaks to his people. He's the God that speaks through his people. He's the voice of many waters. Amen. Amen. Out of your heart will flow a river of living water. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah. I hope you like that. Jesus is the king that walks amidst the golden lampstands. In this version, there's seven. In the temple, there's ten. In the tabernacle, there's one. In this, there's seven. As I said before, when we looked at the tent versus the temple, I've always believed that the tent was God's higher purpose than the temple. I always believe that. Because one idea, God wants to dwell with his people. Tents go with people, temples stay still. But then as we got into this, I noticed that um, as the way Peter used the language of us becoming the living stones to build up this temple, I was like, oh, the language pointed to two ideas simultaneously, not necessarily inferior, but that the temple, the tent pointed, looked more like the, the shadow of God in our individual hearts, and the temple looked more like the shadow of us being collectively built up as the bride of Christ, as the church, as the unified group of, of individuals. Amen? Amen. Yeah. As the voice of many waters, the many waters that the voice would come through. Amen? Yeah. And so as we looked at that, uh, as we hear, as we go into this, there's seven lampstands because there's seven churches. Right? There's I kind of believe there's a there's a tree of life that each and every one of you are supposed to have in your heart and partaking of, but there's also one for the corporate, and the Revelation vision speaks of the corporate one. There's seven churches, seven lampstands. Jesus walks through them. Now, I don't know if you can so see what I see when I pray, read those scripture, but I just see him walking through, running his hand through the flames, just feeling the fire that we're producing because he's the man of fire. Yeah. yeah? I just see this Jesus walking through these torches of fire, these, these lampstands, and, um, and and it's this beautiful invitation. I'm not going to read all of them because I knew we weren't going to have as much time today, but um, there are uh, seven churches. There are seven encouragements and warnings, and, and some of the churches are further off track than others. We're not going to read all of them, but I'm going to read two of the, of the ones that I believe are very important for this conversation. But before we get there, John, in heaven, sees the one standing amongst the lampstands. Feel free to picture it again. The one standing amongst the lampstands, walking amongst the lampstands, the light, girded, um, girded about his chest and a robe down to his feet, eyes, uh, hair and head like white as wool, 
eyes like flames of fire, feet like brass. This thing has a voice of many waters. He's loud like a trumpet. His presence in that realm is intimidating, I think, to say the least. John the Beloved, he titled himself for the rest of history, future, to know him as the one whom Jesus loved. When he saw this Jesus, he falls in fear of the awesomeness of his presence. But Jesus says, just like he's saying to you right now, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. What's to be afraid of then? The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. To the first church, these things, the letter to the first church, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands. He's he, he applauds them for the good things they're doing, but he warns them that they've left their first love. If you've been in the Lord more than 30 seconds, you've probably figured out that this is a continual journey. Yeah. That you can be excited for Jesus for a good season of your life, and then next thing you know, you get a little off track, and then a little off track, and a little off track, and you're just not excited. You're just not living in that first love. Yeah. The good news is, if Jesus would not uh, give us these instructions to this church unless we could all just repent, yeah. turn from our ways, and return yeah. to our first love. Yeah. So just get back to it. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yeah? What does that sound like? Sounds like a garden scenario. You've gotten off track. I, I want to keep the tree of life here. But I, I, if I keep it there now, you're going to get stuck in this state that I can't have you at. Mm. Repent, or else I have yeah. to take it away yeah. from you. Now, he's good. He'll get it back. Yeah. I promise. Yeah. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to you to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeah? This is like one of the few times where the lampstand is the topic, and then he switches to the tree of life language. It's one of the few times it's right next to each other. But I believe it's of the utmost importance. Amen? Yeah. He who has an ear to hear, I cannot have you stuck forever in a place of not oneness with me. You'll spend, he'll spend as much of this time you have on earth as you will give him, getting you to that tree of life, to that oneness where you begin to eat of it right here, right now. We give our lives to Jesus, live completely for him, and are, and are given this access to this immortal life that Jesus promised us. Yes, immortal life that Jesus promised us. Life, not death, as Romans says. Yes? This, this tree of life, this, this, this immortality that Jesus promised us where we enter into a life of the Spirit that never ends. If that doesn't sound good to you, the alternative is death. Just your two options. Just as a selling point. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. Yeah? Later on in Revelation, we're going to read some of these lines today at the end of it. It kind of paints like a paradise, a kingdom on earth scenario. Also, the garden kingdom on earth scenario. Yeah? Guess where Jesus told them the kingdom of God was in Luke. He said, do you not know? The kingdom of heaven is within you. Yeah? Now, I'm not saying our entire idea of eternal existence in the afterlife is all sitting inside of your heart beating. No, it's, but the kingdom reality is in you. Yeah. I just said you're a temple. And what that means is there's a temple in you. You didn't know that either, but now you know there's a tree of life in you. All of these things are getting more and more exciting to me. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> still, don't forget this journey. My country logic says we don't get to the back room without hitting that front gate first. And you don't get past 
the, the altar of atonement or the, or the laver of living water. Like everything's in order because that's the process of time we go through. Because if he's fireproof and ain't nothing but straw houses out there, how good would it be for him just to come out of the hole and burn everything up? Jesus said, I came to save this world. Amen? So we take this journey to become fireproof. Not like not go to hell fireproof. Like I want to be next to the guy whose eyes are on fire fireproof. Yeah? Yeah? Some of our ideas in Western doctrine are so close but so wrong. This was never about not going to hell. It was always about entering into a kingdom of heaven that had a king of fire in the midst of it. Yeah? It's worth the journey. Amen? I wish I could express just how giddy I am, but when I get up here in front of people, I, I kind of have this default play cool mode. I'm sorry, but I'm very excited about this when I'm alone. That's all right. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. This is a different church. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, like I said, each church has its own set of problems. Some are pretty not so bad. Some are pretty bad. Um, the, the rebuke and the promises are all different. I included these two because we're talking about the fact that we are the temple. And in the temple, there was bread and tree and, and lampstands. Manna, Aaron's rod budded, right? This, now we've read two times where Jesus, in the midst of the lampstand, said, I, be careful, I'm going to have to take away your lampstand if you don't repent. But if you do, I'll let you eat that tree of life. Yeah? Now this other church, he's saying, yeah, if you tighten up just a little bit, maybe a whole lot. I'll let you eat that bread of life. Now, what did we say? We said the bread was about reconciling us back to God yeah. so that we could eat the tree of life. Maybe that first church we read about wasn't as off track of this one. This one needs reconciliation before he can eat that tree. Yeah. Amen? Just an idea. You can go back and study that for yourself. Yeah. I always try to promote Bible reading at home. <laughs> Amen? I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the white on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except for him who receives it. I want you to really just take that little line. We're going to brush past it, but take that line and think. How much of you, most of the world says, God, you have got to accept me just like I am? No. Jesus wants to transform you into his image to the degree that he wants to give you a new name. How much of you, do you of your earthly, fleshly self, do you really think is going to be left if at the end of this full process you get like a whole new name and everything? He's not concerned with how he finds you. But he loves you way too much to leave you there. Amen? Amen. All right. And behold, I am coming quickly. This is, we jump to Revelation 22. We jump past the churches and there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in the middle. We won't talk about that because that's like 30 years worth of talking. But okay. towards the end of Revelation, we get this picture of, uh, of this kingdom on earth being transposed onto the earth. A lot of symbolic language. A lot of promises that we will cover this earth on seven continents with glory carrying saints of God and that we will rule and reign on this earth and that we will have no need of government because he will govern our hearts. It's the most beautiful picture I can ever imagine. Yeah? I'm just going to go back to reading some of Jesus' words here. And behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city or in this scenario, temple court. Blessed are those who do the commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life it's not about him loving some more than others. He foreknew every one of you. I promise you. But just like John said, he's the light and every man comes in the world. It says, but not all choose 
the right to become his children. Today is the day, and tomorrow will be another day, and the day after that will be another day that you choose every day to eat the bread of Jesus. The manna fell from heaven every day. Every day it fell from heaven. And you had to get it every day and eat it or else you'd go hungry. Every day except for the sixth day. If you had double portion for the seventh day, the rest of the Lord is, has a, a magical nature to it. We live and operate and we succeed in the rest, in the presence of the Lord. But we do it every day. How many of you know you don't find Jesus one time and then live victoriously the rest of your life without some level of partnership and effort? Now, that might not jive with everyone's doctrine, but that jives with your life, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. We choose every day to eat that, eat that bread. Amen? Yeah. Now, with that in mind, promoting that every day we get up and we seek the Lord, we ask Him to show His face in the midst of these, these, these scriptures, these words, every day, I'm going to prove to you why it has to be done every day. Even with the promise of the tree of life in the midst of it. Yeah. In the garden, God, I like to say Jesus because he was kind of in the beginning and in the beginning was him, you know. But uh, Jesus, God, said to Adam, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So every tree that's in the garden, Adam, can eat, right? Except for the one. The tree of life was in the garden. He was already had permission, and based on his level of curiosity, I bet they had eaten it. Yeah? I bet he had already eaten it. I bet that he could, it's a tree of life that sustains you daily, just like the bread of life. It's a tree of life that if you eat of it, you will live forever. But it's a tree that you must continue eating of. Amen? Mm -hmm. Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, at least, he put out his hand and take also the tree of life, eat and live forever. It's that line that makes us think he took one bite of the apple and now we know evil forever. And now he's going to take one more bite of that lot tree of life and live forever. But the context would allude to he's already been eating it. He was going to live forever. But the day that he ate the knowledge of good and evil, God put him out from it, and that's the day he began to die. So every single day we get up and we seek the bread of Jesus, the bread of reconciliation, the bread that comes from heaven that sustains us. We seek the right to eat the tree of life. Now, I'm not promising you never grow old in this body. This body will mean nothing to you if you truly walk in the clouds with Jesus in your spirit. Yeah? Yeah. We live this life, but we live it every single day. Every choice of every day is a chance to draw closer or further from Him. There is no neutral. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life. Back to Revelation 22 for the heavenly vision. There was a tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each yielding fruit, it, uh, each yielding fruit. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing the nations. Ezekiel, which we're going to get into next week, I believe, had a vision of this heavenly realm that was coming. Along, out of this temple flowed this river of living water, this river of life. And along the riverbanks, was, it was lined with these trees. The same language. It had... Trees lined in the riverbank that had fruit. Every season of the year it bared fruit. It had fruit for food and leaves to heal the nations. Yeah? Just like I say, prayer is like medicine. You wouldn't take one pill and think everything go away forever. You take a bottle of pills, you need to take a whole bunch of prayer if you're going to get through things in the name of Jesus. Leaves that are for healing the nations, it's probably not a single bite. It's probably a continual eating of this. You see what I'm saying? I'm just trying to get, you know, make that yeah. continual yeah. partaking of the things of the Lord is what will sustain us forever. Yeah? yeah? Amen. If you haven't been in the Lord long enough to get the dry spot, I promise you, I don't want to project on you, but you probably will find that sooner or later. Repent, just like he told those churches. Repent, and then I will let you eat the tree of life again. 
I will bring you right back to where you were and I will water that garden. I will water your garden with the river of life that flows out of your yeah, heart. Yeah. It flows out of this temple that's within your heart. And along that river of life that flows out of your heart, there will be trees that landed on both sides with fruit for food to sustain yourself and leaves to heal the nations. And in the river there will be fish, many fish like the fish of the great sea. And wherever the river goes, the fish will go. And where it goes, life will go. Water will escape the banks, and it will become marsh and swamps, and there will be no life in it. But get back in the banks. The river of life is going and going, and it is going to flow straight into the dead sea of humanity. And you and your river of life and the fish of life are going to hit the dead sea of humanity, and it says that everything it touches comes back to life. Yeah. Even the thing that looks like it could never come back to life. Yeah? yeah? yeah. And then the fishermen, the apostles... The, 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 the evangelists of this world, it says the fishermen would line the shores like the fishermen of the great sea and cast nets and draw in. Jesus said, I will make you fishermen of men. Yeah? Not only do you have a choice every day to draw closer to him, we have a job to draw closer to him. Because we are meant to bring a living water that transforms this earth. Yes? Yeah. Blessed are those who who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the holy city. None of this was supposed to convict you about your failings. It's just to encourage you about the promises of the Lord put yeah. in front of you. Amen. Yeah. I've made so many mistakes in my life, and you know what? Jesus ain't holding it against me because I'm moving forward. That's yeah. right. Good. And he will with you too. But you move forward. Forget what lies behind. Look to what's ahead of us. Yes? Yeah. Read your word. Close your eyes and imagine. Imagine the Lord Jesus standing in the midst of the lampstands, running his hands through the flames, desperately desiring to keep us all eating from that tree of life, that bread of reconciliation, that hidden man as he promised he would let the others eat to reconcile us back to him, making us what we were made to be, conformed into his image, light bearers into this world, the river of living water that flows into the dead sea of humanity, bringing life back where there's no hope. Hair white like wool, eyes like intense flames of fire, if you can see those eyes in your mind right now, if he's showing you that, if you're able to shut it all down and see it, you're gonna, he's going to draw you closer and closer, and you're going to find that it's like, a, it's like one of those mirror houses. It just keeps going and going and going into the depths of his eyes. God is good, and God is real. And all throughout the Bible, God would have people who would come and go and meet him in this place and find divine instructions and, and how to move forward in life. I'm not saying you're going to write a new book in the Bible because that's not going to happen. But I am going to say he's going to tell you how to get through your job tomorrow. If you find him every single day. Every day. So right now, Jesus, we just come before you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for meeting us in this place, in this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for healing baby Willow. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for the good report that's going to come. We thank you, Lord, for for touching each and every one of us, for touching those who are pursuing you with all of their heart, even though it's costing them everything. We thank you, Lord, for the, the hunger and the passion you've put in your, your children, the men and women of God, to find you in your word, to find you in prayer, to meet you in the car ride, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless us. Give us the grace to keep at our first love. Yeah. If we've departed from our first love, Lord Jesus, give us the grace to repent and go back. Because we want that tree of life, Lord. We're tired of living in the shadow of death. We want the tree of life. We want to live in the hope of, of eternity and light right now. In your name, Jesus, we gather, we fellowship, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.